Hello from London, everyone. I'm incredibly delighted to be here with one of my favorite actors who played one of my favorite characters mm. in one of my favorite TV shows, Miltos Hirolamu, who played the Bravosi, the master of the water dance, the one and only Sirio Forel on Game of Thrones. Miltos, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, lovely to meet you. Now, before we start, I have to ask you something. Uh -huh. What do we say to the god of death? Not today. <laughs> so, you've said that growing up, one of your most enriching experiences and, and one that initially piqued your interest uh, in acting was playing an active role in your school drama. Mm -hmm. Talk to us more about this time. I mean, I didn't really uh, have a good time at school uh, for lots of reasons. Um, I didn't feel like I fitted in. I felt very different to everyone else I was at school with, to, with. Um, uh, and I, find, I just found, I found myself very alienated from school. I didn't, it just didn't click with me. And I'm sure I'm not alone or the first person to have felt that. But the, the place where I really did feel a connection was when I started doing school drama. And uh, I wasn't very academic, but I could throw myself into drama and using my imagination uh, in very, very uh, motivated ways. Mm. So that really did, that did help me at school. Um, I had very good English teachers who made uh, literature come alive for me. Uh, and I started to, to really enjoy Shakespeare, even though I would say that my love for it didn't really happen until much later when I worked at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Mm. Um, I did my very first school drama when I was nine years old. Okay. It was a mime called The Clockwork Policeman and I played the Clockwork Policeman. Mm. And uh, that's where I kind of found my, uh, my aptitude to learn choreography because there was no uh, language or no, no words in that performance. It was, all, it was like a dance. Mm. Um, and I went on to do more dance as well when I became a professional actor. I was very lucky to work with lots of uh, great choreographers, which kind of leads to learning fight choreography. But, but yeah, I, I was very lucky. But the majority of plays that I did at school were your kind of run-of-the-mill musicals. Mm. West Side Story, The right. Bo Boyfriend, Cabaret, one of my favorites. Um, these were the things that we did. And so, in a way, it was kind of quite a sheltered understanding of what theatre was. Because when I went on to study uh, drama at university, I was doing a much more performance art based course. So I was being introduced to, to very avant-garde methods of work and approaches to work. And so that literally blew my mind because I'd mm. gone from musicals to, to something where anything right. goes. Right. And take us through your journey auditioning for the role of Serial Pharrell in the first place. So I was very lucky because uh, I was very good friends with the casting director, Nina Gold. Okay. And uh, Nina Gold is a, a hero of mine, a heroine of mine, because she's one, of, she's one of the few casting directors that I know who does the legwork and goes to meet um, actors everywhere from watching them doing stuff on TV and in the cinema, which are the obvious easy places to see people performing, to going to small venues above pubs uh, all over the country and literally does her, does, does, you know, goes out and sees actors in all sorts of places and so has a very uh, uh, wide ranging knowledge of who is out there. Mm. And, and so I was very lucky in that respect. It was also lucky because Game of Thrones pretty much auditioned nearly every British actor that there was at the time, I'm sure. I imagine. Because <laughs> there's so many, you know, so much cast to, to cast, so many right. characters to cast. Right. Um, but I, I read for, they gave me a, a, the part of 
varies, Lord Varys, mm, okay. to, to, to read. Okay. And, uh, and it was a scene where he goes to see Ned in, in prison and tells him, you know, take the black. This is going to save your family. Do it for your family. Do it for your daughters. Mm. You will save their lives. And he agrees to it. It's a fantastic scene. Right. And so I, I learned that and I read it. And uh, although they, they liked my reading of it, they didn't think I was right for that part, but they came back with Sirio Pharrell. And, uh, and so I auditioned. I had to do the very first scene, which is three and a half minutes long of right. just me talking. Right. Uh, and I remember, because <laughs> you do it a few times. And the first time you do it, you do the audition, but then you forget about it. Because if you cared about every audition you ever went to, you would become obsessed with uh, you know, getting these jobs, which of course, the, the, the law of averages means that you're not going to Absolutely. get them, you know? Yeah. Um, so usually, the first couple of times, you just do the audition and you forget about it. Okay. But once you're doing it for the fifth time, you know that you're, they obviously like you. Mm. And that's when you start to really get worried about it because you know <laughs> that the closer you get to the role, the, the closer you yeah. get to losing it. Right, right. <laughs> and so you care a lot about it. Absolutely. And I'm terrible. If, I'm, if I really want a job, I'm, I'm awful at auditions. I get very nervous. Mm. But if I don't really want the job, I always end up getting it because I come across very relaxed. Okay. <laughs> so that's the irony. Mm. Um, but by the fifth time, uh, when they said the Americans were coming and David and Dan came over and the mm -hmm. head of HBO and literally everyone came to see you in person, you knew it was between you and probably one other actor. And uh, I remember doing that scene for them, the very first lesson with Aria, and it was three and a half minutes long. Remember, most people do a, do, do a couple of pages for their auditions. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, uh, Benioff going, Wow, that's a long scene. I was like, no kidding, Sherlock. <laughs> I had to learn it. <laughs> you know. Right. And I thought, oh my God, I must have bored him because it's like anything that feels long means that, you know, you're not engaged. Yep. But it was the opposite. So uh, luckily I got the job. So that was, that was the torturous obstacle course of getting the role. That is quite the experience. Um, so when you first auditioned for the role of Varys, did Conleth Hill audition for Serio or no? <laughs> that would have been interesting. <laughs> I've never asked him that. Okay. If, if I see him, I'll, I will ask him, but I don't know. I okay. Don't know. Okay. Um, how did you find the entire Game of Thrones experience on set, and what was a typical day like for you? Uh, Nerve-wracking. Because mm. not only did I have to re remember my lines, I had to remember my choreography. And we worked on it. I was very lucky. I, I worked with an amazing uh, fight choreographer called uh, uh, William Hobbs, which unfortunately he died last year. Mm. Uh, but he was my mentor and he was the one who helped me cook up the vocabulary of the water dance. Uh, and he was amazing and uh, came at it from a character point of view. Mm. I wanted to kind of go, I wanted to bounce off the walls and do cool stuff and he said, no, we have to know who the character is. I'm not going to choreograph anything without knowing who this man is that you're supposed to be playing. And it was a brilliant approach because, you know, that's what made him so good and understanding, you know, how to, you know, what his movement was like, he, not let alone how his, his, his uh, sword play was. Mm. It was like, how does he stand? How does he carry himself? Mm. Uh, all of these things fed into the character and he was an amazing man and really helped me. And then of course we ended up working with stunt coordinators and uh, fight co coordinators creating the actual fights and that took a little while to rehearse. Mm. Both me and Maisie made it our pact that we were never going to let our stunt doubles do any work on screen. So, so it's all us. Uh, and I think she stuck to it mm. to this day. You know, mm. she did all her stunts herself. Um, but you know, that that process was quite nerve-wracking because there was just so much to remember. And I'm not the calmest actor in the world. <laughs> I, you know, my nerves are kind of make up part of my energy, and mm. so I've kind of embraced that. But it's hard sometimes because I remember <sighs> meeting Francis McGee, who played Yoren. And he's an actor I know and I've worked with a lot. He's got a lot of film and TV experience. And I was going to do my first day and he was coming to, to fin he just finished. 
And I said, hey, Francis, it was the first time I'd seen him. I said, how are you? And he went, oh, man. And, oh, you know, like, he was like, <laughs> God, that was hard. And I was like, my wife, I just went white. And I went, I was already nervous. So yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. this is not going to go well. There's too much pressure, you know. But it's one of those things that once you just get out there, you walk on set. Yeah. And that set is something else, I you know. Yeah. It looks impressive on screen, but it looks equally impressive when you're there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're dressed, you walk on set, everyone's there, they're supporting you. David and Dan always said, look, you know, we take as long as it takes. Mm. These scenes are very important. They establish Arya's character. It establishes this relationship, which is really important. And so we've got to get it right. And that really put me at ease and, and really helped me. And every time we did that, we, we came, you know, exactly the same thing. And I think it was that sense of encouragement and support from every single person from top to bottom, which is why those performances are so so fantastic you know so and, and the show is has a, a certain kind of uh vibe that you mm. can feel you know great you know, there's lots of great shows with great performances and great stories great writing mm. but there's something about that that energy they conjured by getting that group of people into a certain space into a world mm. that that really worked really worked Going off of that, how easy was it for you to snap in and out of character? I'm assuming the sets definitely helped in some way. Well, you know, the easiest way of explaining that is I remember before I shot my very first thing, Mm. that first scene was the first thing we shot. It's one of the very first things that they shot at all for Game of Thrones. Okay. And just before, I was just getting into character, you know, getting into character, whatever that means. <laughs> just <laughs> trying to remember your lines, basically, that's what that means. Right. Um, and just before we started, I went, hang on, hang on, hang on. I just, before we go on any further, and I ran over David and Dan, who were sitting by the monitors, and I said, I've never asked you, how do you want me to play Sirio Farrell? Because, <laughs> you know, they just assumed, just do it the way you want to do it. And, yeah. I was, and I, so I had to ask them, I said, you know, I could make him less flamboyant, I can make him more flamboyant, I can make... what? We've never talked about it. How do you want me to play it? And he went... Right. And they just went... They put their hands on my arm and just went, it's okay, just mm. do it the way you did it for okay. us. Okay. That's the reason why we gave you the job. Just do it that... Just trust your instincts. And so that's how I did it. That's literally how I did it. So yeah. as far as uh, how did I snap in and out of character... Mm. I just remembered to, to trust my instincts. How long did it take to, to sort of film all your scenes? In, in total? So we shot it over a, uh, the whole period of filming. So we shot the very first ep, uh, seat, seat, uh, lesson okay. right at the beginning. That must have been beginning of July. Okay. And then I came back two months later to do the second episode. Mm. And then I think a few weeks later to, to shoot the scene with the Lannister. So it kind of was spread out. And each scene took a couple of days. Okay. And as you were on set filming, how was the camaraderie between you and, and your other co-stars? Well, it was just me and Maisie, to yeah. be honest, mm. uh, apart from the amazing Hungarian stuntmen who I got to fight with at the end, and yeah. Ian Beatty, who was my nemesis, Merrin Trant. Right. And of course, Sean Bean, who very graciously stood at the back watching me and Maisie do that scene over Absolutely. and over again. Yeah. Uh, and at the end came up and just went, introduced himself, <laughs> like he needed to Sean introduce Bean. himself. Yeah, exactly. What a man, what a wow. man. Wow. So it was, yeah, it was, it was great. And, and me and Maisie got on immediately. It's wonderful. You know, that was, it, it was very easy with her. Yeah. Um, what are some of the, the things you did to, to specifically perhaps prepare for this role? Um, obviously, you had prior experience as a dancer and an actor, but how did you additionally prepare for this? Working with William Hobbs. Okay. Bill was very good at kind of uh, getting to the essence of who this character was. 
you know, how do you portray a man who is born with a sword in his hand, who has only ever known a world that is completely alien to my, me? Uh, you know, it takes a bit of imagination, but it also is based in a lot of historical truth. It's like mm. there was a time when people lived like that, you know, mm. and it made you think in a particular way. It was lucky because he's quite an honourable man, uh, a very noble man, quite sophisticated from a place, Bravos, which is a rich, affluent, sophisticated place in that world. Absolutely. So all of those things kind of fed into it. But the most important thing was just to remember his poise. And also his exoticism, you know, I mean, no, it's sure. very interesting that, 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 you know, I sometimes look at it and I go, oh, I don't know. I think <laughs> if I was doing that character now, I think I'd just ease off a little bit. But mm. there was something about his energy and kind of um, flamboyance, I would say, mm. that they liked. And I understand it now because he's written in the books as uh, small, bald headed with a exactly. hook nose. Yep. And we talked a lot about do we have, do we keep the hair or do we shave the hair? Mm. And in the end, uh, George R. R. Martin said, the reason why I wrote him the way I did was that he was supposed to be very different to the hairy, bearded, big guys that, that you see in Westeros. In Westeros, yeah. And you were different enough without being bored or with a big, without a big nose. So right. to me, that, that you summed up exactly what I was trying to get at. You know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And one of the things in particular that, that Arya calls you Sirio is the greatest swordsman who ever lived. Uh -huh. So I want to ask you, what in particular makes Sirio fit this role so well? Ah, that's a good question. The first sort of bravos is obviously the right-hand man, the bodyguard to the to the king, right. the queen, mm. the, whoever that leader is. Mm. And they are almost mystical in their abilities. It's kind of like being a Jedi, like a knight. Yeah. Uh, they live by code, maybe more like a samurai. Mm. They live by a code there is honor, there is a certain way of being. And he was at the peak of those people. That's why he was chosen to be the first sword. Right, right. Uh, probably uh, trained from a child. That's why I always say that he was born with a sword in his hand. Right. Definitely think that. Mm. Probably could juggle swords as well as fight with them. Yeah. That's the kind, that's where I was always thinking. Okay. Like someone that just understands the skills so mm. acutely mm. that it can turn their hands to anything. Probably excellent at cooking. Probably yeah. uses swords to chop up food. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, you know, that, that yeah. Uh, articulate. Yeah. Um, and, and perhaps there's also something to, it, to do with a difference between the Bravosi style of fighting and the Westerosi style. Bravosi yeah. being prob definitely more graceful, whereas the Westerosi just went for the straight up. Well, you know, using yeah. those broadswords, those bastard swords, yeah. takes a lot of strength. Right. Uh, but what's interesting is that the swords, the, you know, those wooden practice swords, mm. they're weighted. They're not just wood, they're no. weighted with lead. Okay. And they were made like that. Okay. And because I was trying to, to impress everyone, I didn't say to them initially that the, the wooden sword was too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and because you have to use it with one hand, everyone else gets to use their sword. It was heavier than a, than a steel sword. Imagine right. that, right? Right. And you, this, this with one hand mm. for days on end, the ligaments in my wrist were, were completely kaput wow. and were you really damaged for about three months afterwards okay. because it was heavy. Yeah. I remember some people on a forum saying, oh, I don't know whether Sirio Ferrell would have been able to knock out the first uh, a king's guard with his wooden sword. I was like, 
you want to be, you want to bet. <laughs> that's exactly pick up, what pick it up is. that because that's this thing that the armory guys, uh, Tommy and that crew, mm. they made those weapons mm. exactly as they were described in the books. Okay, okay, yeah. and and Maisie because she was thirteen years old mm. and a little girl went, uh, this is far too heavy for me, <laughs> me trying to impress everyone and not wanting to sound like like I couldn't do it didn't didn't complain at all I really should have okay I would have should have said please take that thing out the middle because it's so heavy <laughs> but it did make it easy to balance on one hand mm. so you know swings and roundabouts yeah for sure um, what did you find most gratifying from your time on Game of Thrones just learning something yeah. that I had dabbled in but you know, working with people like William Hobbs and mm. Buster Reeves, who, were, who was one of the stunt coordinators, who really was the guy who kind of put those fights together. Right. Um, and learning, learning something that you had to practice, that it was more than just remembering your lines and not bumping into the furniture. Mm. It was like there was something I really had to focus on, the discipline of that. I have a perverse love of always doing things that are outside my comfort zone. Absolutely. I have no yeah. idea why, yeah. because like I said, I'm quite a nervous, nervous. performer. Yeah. Yeah. But for some reason, I'd much rather it be that way than the other. Mm. So that, that was really, that, that was a, I felt it was a great accomplishment, and Definitely. I was very proud of myself. Mm. As a huge serial fan myself, and I'm sure many of our viewers um, are as well, can we throw ourselves back in time a little bit and have you say a few sentences in the Bravosi accent. <laughs> Which all came from me doing an impersonation of my father. Wow, yeah. That's yeah. where it started from and then I kind of like just tweaked it so it didn't sound like it was just Greek Cypriot. Okay. <laughs> there is only one God and his name is Death. And there is only one thing we say to the God of Death. Not today. Not today. <sighs> it chills every time. And, and when I asked you that question in the beginning, I was thinking to myself, you know, how could we not start, how could we start this interview and not <laughs> ask you this question? Um, came back in season eight and everyone immediately thought, wow, yeah, Sirio Pharrell's still alive in spirit because I know many of the fans were expecting him to sort of somehow be alive um, like well he kind of right? was he, he was. never yeah, really yeah. ever left Arya right right absolutely and he never really ever left her yeah. yeah I think that's what's so kind of cool about those I mean I'm sure that's the reason why George wrote it the way he wrote it because he also wrote the episode where we have that you know the last time you see Syria he wrote that episode mm. and uh, I believe because I, I wanted a delicious gruesome bloody death <laughs> But he wouldn't write it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't give it to me. Yeah. And, and I know that that as a na piece of storytelling narrative, you know, a, t a technique or a, a thing, this idea of keeping Syria alive happens because of the ambiguity. It's like I always say that there is this, uh, you l obviously he writes the books from from the perspective yeah. of the characters, mm -hmm. the points of view. So as soon as Arya leaves, you know, they, you leave with her. But what that does, without knowing really what happens, is that it just keeps him alive in her head. Definitely. If she'd witnessed him dying, the trauma would have changed something, I'm sure, in her mind. Right. But because right. she doesn't, mm. those words, the mantras, stay alive in her head and she repeats them and repeats them in the book she continues to repeat them so right. Right. so the idea that this line comes back right at the end kind of felt like that's that was that's I mean I know that little bit about the god of death wasn't actually in the books it right was something Dave and Dan created but mm. but I think it was it was a nice bit of storytelling and I think she definitely Arya definitely used that light you just mentioned as motivation to kill Marin Trand as well yeah um, so, yeah, no, for sure. Um, and so taking Serial out for a quick second, if there is any other Game of Thrones character you had the chance to play, which one would it be and why? Oh, I would like 
uh, little finger. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's always nice playing Machiavelli and difficult characters like that. Yeah. 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 I really, I really like, or just for the sheer fun of it, someone mm. like Bron, mm. just because he gets great lines and is such a. I mean, <laughs> yeah. such a bastard of a character. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. Those are the two that I, 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 uh, I, I really think that I would have enjoyed to play as well. Okay. Let's go to season eight. Um, what were your thoughts on the way season eight panned out, and and in particular the way it ended? I like the way it ended. I, I, I in fact, I think. All the beats in it were fantastic. I'm, I was a little, God. I mean, it's like it's 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 you know, it's it's a it's it's such a easy thing. Everyone, it's e- so easy to be critical, right? Absolutely. The the thing that happens immediately is that we 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 have everyone has such expectations, and it's very rare to watch a show where you know it's going to have. An end, Absolutely. and that end has to tie up so many mm. uh, pieces, complicated pieces. God knows how uh, George R. R. Martin is going to do it because exactly. he has even more uh, pieces of the puzzle to, 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 to. And no wonder it's taking him so long to write. Definitely. Definitely. So I completely get that. Mm. But from my own point of view, I think season seven and eight. I I think. I, I would have liked to just see more. I think mo- the, the biggest thing is, without the books, yeah. it's a diff. It's a, you know the books are so intricate. Mm. So untying those stories and finding a way to show them on screen, yeah. you have to change it. Of course, it's not it's not the same medium at mm. all. Mm. But you have such uh, such rich. Uh, 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 what's the word? Such rich um, stories Story. to 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 to, uh, to explore mm. and to to use. Uh, and without that, it comes down to how do you put it on screen? And sometimes it becomes a little bit about hitting big moments mm. whereas I think with a little bit more time and a few more episodes we could have filled in some of the intricacies yeah, yeah. some of the shade yeah so so you know John being banished going beyond the wall yep. I loved mm. uh, Sansa becoming queen of the north I loved mm. Bran who, being who put on the, yeah. being put on, you know, ruling. I mean, I completely buy that. All of those things. Danny, going, uh, getting, going dark yep. and and uh, burning King's Landing to to a crisp. I buy, you know, but it's just how we got there. Mm. I feel yeah. sometimes we had to take huge lurches yep. and pull the audience along with us when in fact we just needed to to just see it happen over a bit more time yeah i don't yeah. know this six is episodes just, is not this a lot is of just time this is just it. my yeah you know but you know episode two some yeah. of the great i mean i love that yes. yes just seeing those characters deal with this final night exactly you exactly. know i love that yep so, so, so there was so much to take away, so much to enjoy from the last season, mm. and I, you know, I, 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 I think it's very unfair for the haters to kind of be so down on it. It's, mm. it's. I don't, don't believe that for a second. You know, we can all kind of, you know, want what we wanted from it. Our expectations were always going to be high and probably impossible to fulfil. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I think. Not having the books kind of probably hindered, yeah, yeah, hindered the finishing of the of the story. Yeah, that makes sense. But it'll be great. To, it'll be very interesting to see what ends up when we get, when when we read the, the the books. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that for sure. Because um, everyone's going to be going, oh, okay. <laughs>
probably Dave and Dan will be okay. Maybe we should <laughs> film this bit. <laughs> film this <again. laughs> that makes sense. Um, now, you know, were you expecting, and I have to ask you this, were you expecting Arya to kill Danny instead of John? Oh, it's so complicated because it's like wanting Jamie to kill Cersei. Mm. Which many people thought was really happen. wanted. Yep. I think I did too, yep. but in hindsight you can't you can't have Jamie killing Cersei and mm. then John killing Danny. It's like it's you're repeating the same beat and right. it's like you can't do that. Mm. So once John John you see John kills Danny, it's like it's impossible for for just as, as storytellers, you just go, you wouldn't do that twice. Mm. So I completely get it, and, and the both of them dying in each other's arms, I completely buy. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. A A Arya killing the Night King and then killing Cersei maybe is the same thing. Okay. Two beats of the same, yeah. kind of killing two big bads, maybe impossible. Maybe, may, maybe Arya killing Cersei. Mm -hmm. No, Jamie killing Cersei, and then Jamie take his face off. It's Arya, and then Jamie walking in to find that Cersei still just dying, yeah. and then dying in the rubble. Yeah, maybe. But mm -hmm. there again, you know, like it's so easy. It's so easy to kind of do that. Definitely, I think it's better that that uh, Arya didn't. Okay. I read, uh, something else happens. Mm. I'm glad that they that she killed the Night King. I really buy that because, you know, she's a ninja. <laughs> only a, only someone with supernatural skills can can kill the Night King, and it had yeah. to be uh, using the techniques she learned from Syria. Yeah, yeah, and also Jacken yep. and the Hound, yep. and you know, all of these mentors to her Definitely. taught her what she taught. Absolutely. you know taught her those those things so yeah yeah um what qualities so moving away from game of thrones quickly um what qualities in your opinion make up a good actor truthfulness mm. sincerity sensitivity mm. i think the old-fashioned idea that actors kind of just put a layer on top of themselves and pretend mm. There's a grain of that because, of course, you know, using our imaginations is one of the things that we do, that we have to do. Mm. We have to, but most of it, I think, what more, more importantly, is empathy. That you can kind of see another person's point of view, so that you can portray them in a sincere and honest and authentic way. And uh, and I think that's pretty much the most important thing. Mm. I don't think it's very easy, but. It's kind of like what I think we should strive for. Yeah. For all our young viewers, um, what advice would hey you kids. give? Hey, kids. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so for all our young viewers, what advice would you give um, to them, to youth, um, aspiring to become actors or actresses and enter the film industry? Don't do it if you want a, s a secure life <laughs> and a relationship. <laughs> and money to pay your rent don't do it no <laughs> seriously uh that but mm. also if you don't listen to that and can't help but want to follow your dreams which you should always do is is to try and always do it for the right reasons and for me the right reasons is that you have a story to tell you have something you want to express or say and as much as we need other people to employ us and to give us jobs because you know that that's that's kind of where we all want to be yeah you know want to work for high profile people who who when you when you do something people will watch it and right. like it you know uh, these things are these things are important but the, what's even more important than that is to to do things that you believe in. Mm. Always do things that you believe in. Tell a story that means something to you. Because mm. I guarantee you, if you do that, you would do it in such a way that will count. Either to the person watching or yourself. Mm. And whenever I've become disillusioned with this business, 
which is very easy to, to do um, for those reasons I said at the beginning of, that, of this answer, mm. is um, the thing that you always come back to is doing things that you believe in. Mm. That kind of means something to you. Because if you tell a story that matters to you, then it pretty much will matter to someone else. Wonderfully and powerfully said, actually. I want to end with a brief rapid fire round in which I ask you a series of, let's say, eight or nine questions. And okay. if you could answer or keep your answers to, let's say, one, one word okay. or one phrase, that would be great. Um, so let's start. Um, Westeros or Essos? Essos. Okay. Your favorite Game of Thrones character besides you and Arya? I'm assuming Arya. Jamie Lannister. Mm. Well, one word you would use to describe or to characterize Cyril Pharrell? Noble. Mm. Your favorite Game of Thrones season? Season two. Mm. Favorite Game of Thrones episode? Hard home. <laughs> so that was a hard one. <laughs> um, one Game of Thrones location you wish you had filmed in? Iceland. Mm. Who is Miltos the actor a fan of? Mark Ruffalo. Amazing. Activist and awesome actor. Yes. Your all-time favorite movie? Alien. And some of your favorite hobbies? Cycling, scuba diving, being in the countryside, walking my nice. dog. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. And with that, that's a wrap. So thank you so much um, for, for being here today, Multos. It's, it's been fantastic, and it's been truly a pleasure having you on the show. My absolute, and I truly appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Nice to meet you.